it's just a real pleasure to be here and to um, to share our ideas um, on a Friday afternoon. Um, thanks for being here on a Friday afternoon, um, on a sunny Friday afternoon. So what I want to do today, and I guess, is it, I'm just, does that help at all? I can do my, is that okay? You, you can all hear me okay, right? Yeah. yeah. Okay. So what I want to do today is just tell you a little bit about this, this book, um, How Forests Think. And I want to do it in a kind of imagistic register. I want to be able, I want to give you examples that, I mean, I'm going to be talking about fairly complicated things, but I'm going to try to talk about it in a way that you'll have pictures to hold on to, and those are the pictures that you can hopefully be able to think of. And so I'm trying in some ways to carry, as you'll hear as talk progresses, You'll hear that when I talk about how forests think, I'm talking about a kind of thinking that is often picture-like. So I want to use that in my talking about how forests think, and as a way for sharing um, these kinds of thoughts. So grab onto these kinds of images that I'm giving you as a way to continue to think of this. So as Jeff was saying, this book is based on my ethnographic work on how the Quechua speaking runa of Ecuador's upper Amazon, a little village called Avila, um, relate to the many kinds of beings, animals, but also spirits and ghosts, that people, um, the, uh, the people, the forests uh, in which, around which they live. And these sort of forests are among some of the densest thickets of life on our planet. And tropical rainforests have lots of life. It's an important sort of thing that I want to. I want you to keep in mind. Um, the title, How Forests Think, is a provocation. <clears throat> I want to say that forests really think. And although I'm making, I'm a, I'm a social cultural anthropologist, and what do social cultural anthropologists do? They make arguments through ethnography. Um, although that's what I am and that's what I do, I'm not simply arguing that the runa think that forests think. I'm saying that forests really think. And I want to. And it's a claim that I want to make, uh, and I think it should be a claim that um, I hope uh, an evolutionary biologist would agree with. Um, so it's a claim of that sort that I'm making. Because this is actually something, capture something about the properties of the world in which we live, not necessarily rather from humans. Um, so it's a very strange project in that sense, because it's ethnographic but not ethnographic. And I want to convince you today, I want to try to convince you, that forests, in fact, think. And then, I've gotten you that far, once you enter this sylvan form of thinking, I want to explore with you some of the, some of the ways this changes our fund fundamental assumptions about what it means to be human, and how we might go about thinking about the relation we humans have to the world that lies beyond us. So the kind of anthropology I'm proposing places us in a special position to rethink the sorts of concepts we use and to develop new ones. It develops a method for crafting conceptual tools out of the unexpected properties of the world that we discover ethnographically. As we learn to attend to that which lies beyond the human, certain strange phenomena suddenly come to the fore, and these strange phenomena amplify, and in the process come to exemplify some of the properties of the world in which we live. In the process, it shakes up foundational analytical concepts such as context, representation, relation, self, difference, form, and kind. And if through our form of analysis, we can find ways to further amplify these phenomena, we can then cultivate them as concepts and mobilize them as tools. So that's what I'm trying to do with thinking for us. The question still remains why. Why is this important? To what end am I doing this? What I want to argue towards the end of the paper is that to develop an ethical practice in what we've come to call the Anthropocene, this indeterminate epoch of ours in which human and non-human kinds and futures are increasingly entangled and threatened, we need to find ways to actualize certain not necessarily human modes of being that are all too human modes of being sometimes high. We need, in short, to think with and like forests. Now, the element of sylvan thinking 
that I wish to highlight involves the counterintuitive ways in which life and thought involve what, what my mentor Terry Deacon would call an absential logic. And this absential logic is what I'm going to try to get at in this, in this talk. And this is a very weird thing, it's something that's very difficult for us to understand, but with our implicit metaphysical frameworks, the, one we carry, the ones we carry around with us as Westerners, as anthropologists, as scientists, metaphysical frameworks are privileged existence, presence, difference in materiality. So why does it seem so weird for me to say that forests think? I'm going to suggest that the sense of strangeness has to do with how we think about thinking, and especially how we think about thinking in terms of human language. That is, we tend to conflate human language with something that is actually broader. And this broader thing is, sometimes we call it representation. Human language, we all know, is the product of a representational system that involves signs that relate to each other based on convention. The word dog only refers to that furry, four-legged creature by virtue of its conventional relationship to other words in the language we call English. Even the most radical post-humanists hold that when we talk about representation, we are using human language as the model. Now, this seems like a technical point, but it's important for understanding how we can think with forests. I want to show you that we can actually step out of language to appreciate a broader representational field that holds this exceptionally human form of representation. To think about how representation is something greater than language, it's helpful to think of signs the way philosopher Charles Peirce did. This is a 19th century philosopher that I draw on a lot in my work. For Peirce, representational signs are not just language-like. In his terminology, which names forms of thinking that existed well before he named them, and exists, I will argue, ways in which the world, the living world, thinks. There are three basic kinds of sign processes. Those are iconic, that's the most basic kind, and which involve signs that share a likeness with the objects to which they refer. The signs that share qualities in common which they offer to with the object they represent. Those are icons. Then those are, there are those that are indexical, which have some sort of correlation with their objects. And then there are those that are symbolic, like the word dog that I just mentioned, that have a conventional and arbitrary relationship to their objects. So now I'll illustrate this. I've just laid out a few things. I want to illustrate it with a very simple example that hopefully will allow you to grasp this. Toward the end of a day spent walking in the forest, Hilario San Lucionari came upon a troop of woolly monkeys moving through the canopy. Lucio shot and killed one, and the rest of the troop dispersed. One young monkey, however, got separated from the troop. Finding herself alone, she hid high up in the branches of a tree. In the hopes of startling that monkey to move into a more visible perch so that his son could shoot it, Ilani decided to fell a nearby palm tree. And this is what he said. Look out. Ta ta. I'll make it go po ho. Watch out. So I've, I've uh, translated a few things and I've left a few things in my oral description. I've, ta ta and po ho I have not translated. Ta ta and po ho are images that sound like what they mean. Ta-ta is an image of chopping. Ta-ta. Po'o captures the process by which a tree falls. The snap that initiates its toppling, the swish of the crown free falling through layers of forest canopy, and the crash of its echoes as it hits the ground. These are all unfolded, all enfolded in this sonic image. Ilario then went and did what he said. He walked off a little ways and with his machete began chopping rhythmically at a palm tree. The tapping of steel against trunk is clearly audible on the recording I made in the forest that afternoon. Ta, 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 ta. As was the palm crashing down. Po, po. So, here is the recording I made that afternoon. I want you to hear it. Ta, ta, po, he's saying it, right? 
just walking off. such as Tata and Po'o, are like the entities they represent, thanks to the ways in which the differences between sign and vehicle and object, here in this case the utterance and the unfolding action it simulates, tend to be ignored. These would be iconic in person's terms. Now, as an Iladio had anticipated, the sound of the palm tree crashing frightened the monkey from her perch. This event itself and not just as before the fact imitation, can also be taken to be a kind of a sign. It's a sign in the sense that it too came to be, quote, something which stands to somebody for something in some respect or capacity, unquote, as Perse's definition of sign has it. That's Perse's, how Perse defines a sign. A sign is something which stands to somebody for something in some respect or capacity. Now, what's interesting here, is that, in this case, the somebody to whom this sign stands is not human. The palm tree crashing down stands for something to the monkey, and it's a different kind of a sign. It's an index. It points to some sort of potentially dangerous change. So I want to draw out two implications about signs from this simple example. First, signs are not restricted to humans. They're intrinsic to biological life. And I'm not just talking about animals with brains like woolly monkeys who can think in what we chauvinistically call real time. The most basic evolutionary processes are semiotic processes. The adaptive selective process to which organisms come to fit the world is semiotic. Wings over evolutionary time have come to represent, in some way or another for the bird lineages that have them, the currents of air against which they flap. They are signs, the thoughts about the world. And like other thoughts, and unlike inanimate matter, they are the products of learning over time by experience, even if this time is an evolutionary time. Now this changes what we mean by self. Wherever there are living thoughts, there's also a self. Self at its most basic level is an outcome of semiosis. It's an outcome of a process that involves the formation and interpretation of signs. There's no self outside of thinking, no homunculus that uses signs that is not herself fully made by such signs. It's rather the thinking that creates the real effect of signs. The real effect of self, sorry. The thinking, semiosis, creates the self. This is true for biological organisms, for societies, for humans for individuals, for groups. This self is the locus of a living dynamic by which signs come to represent the world around them to a someone who emerges as such as a result of this process. The world is thus animate. We are not the only kinds of we. Selves are thoughts. And the modes by which such selves relate with one another stem from their constitutively semiotic nature. So when I say that forests think, this is exactly what I mean. Second point, we do not live in a world fully made by context. Consider sound images like po'o and ta-ta. They're not fully in language. They're parasites, indifferently carried along by language, never fully entering or being made over by its systemic logic. For example, they can't be inflected or negated, and they resonate with the features of the world around them. Proof of this is that one can acquire a feeling for their meaning without knowledge of Kichwa's linguistic context. I venture that Pu'o somehow feels to you like a tree falling through the canopy and crashing to the ground, and that Ta-Ta somehow feels to you like tapping, whereas, say, for example, the following word, 
Kaosan Ichu, which is a highly inflected, socially embedded compound word sentence in Quechua. It's a greeting that literally means, are you alive? I venture that this does not sound like that to you, right? When you hear Tata and I say, oh yeah, that's tapping, you're like, oh yeah, that's tapping. When you hear Kaosan Ichu, I'm like, that's not a greeting. You're like, huh? Right? Different. Context is the product of symbolic thinking. I speak Kichwa, and I tell you that Kaosan Ichu feels like a greeting to me, right? Because I get the context. Context is the product of symbolic thinking. You need to know the conventional, linguistic, and cultural, historical context to get what Kaosan Ichu means. And getting context, of course, is our game. Whether we are cultural anthropologists, historians, Foucaultian genealogists, or even Latourian actor network theorists, we're after context. But not all thinking, human and non-human, is confined to context. There are other kinds of relational logics. This is why Ilario can communicate with a monkey, and why you can feel ta-ta and po And this is why I can venture to talk about how forests think without couching it in the context how the runa think, forests think, or the particular semiotic context, or the context of the particular semiotic theories that allow me to say that the force thinks. Right? Thinking beyond context opens the human. So force think and thinking with force changes our assumptions about the context. Thinking with force also disrupts something else, our implicit tendency to think in terms of presence. The assumption that reality is at bottom object like The sense that, regarding non-humans, it's their materiality that has to find its way into our thinking. Thinking for us reveal a weird, counterintuitive relational logic that involves absence. And here I'm indebted to Gregory Bateson, and especially, as I mentioned, Terry Hinkin. And this is what, this kind of essential stuff is what I'm going to be looking at for the rest, for the rest of my talk. So consider, and this is an example I, I adapt from Terry Deacon uh, in his book, Symbolic Species. Consider the cryptically camouflaged Amazonian insect known as the walking stick in English, because its elongated torso looks so much like a twig. Its each one name is Shanga. Entomologists call it appropriately a phasmid, as in phantom. This name is fitting. What makes these creatures so distinctive is their lack of distinction. They disappear like a phantom into the background. Now, how did they come to be so phantasmic? The evolution of such creatures reveals important things about some of the phantom-like or essential logical properties of semiosis that can, in turn, help us understand some of the counterintuitive properties of life itself, properties that are amplified in the Amazon and Runa ways of living there. So how did walking sticks come to be so invisible, so phantom-like? That such a phasma that looks like a twig doesn't depend on anyone noticing this resemblance. And that's our usual understanding of how likeness works. Rather, its likeness is the product of the fact that the ancestors of its potential predators did not notice its ancestors. So these potential predators fail to notice the differences between these ancestors of walking sticks and actual twigs. Over evolutionary time, <coughs> those lineages of walking sticks that were least noticed survived. Thanks to all the proto-walking sticks that were noticed and eaten, because they differed from their environments, walking sticks came to be more like the world of twigs around them. Now, how walking sticks came to be so invisible reveals some of the important properties of iconicity. Iconicity, the most, that most basic of science processes, processes, is highly counterintuitive because it involves a dynamic in which two things are not distinguished. Now, we tend to think of icons, like the sign on the restroom, the boy or the girl or whatever, um, as signs that point to the similarities among things we know to be different. We know that sign is not the boy. We know that the but semiosis is not actually, that's not really the way iconic logic actually works. There's something more deeper, which is actually about confusion. Because semiosis does not begin with the recognition of any intrinsic similarity or difference. 
Rather, it begins with not noticing possible errors. It begins with indistinction or confusion. For this reason, iconicity occupies a space at the very margins of semiosis, but there's nothing semiotic about never noticing anything at all. Iconicity marks the beginning and end of thought. With icons, new interpretants, these are, it's a Persian term that refers to subsequent, subsequent signs that would further specify something about their objects. With icons, further interpretants are no longer produced. With icons, thought is at rest. So understanding something, however provisional that understanding may be, involves an icon. It involves an image that is a likeness of that object. And for this reason, all semiosis ultimately relies on the transformation of more complex signs into icons. And for this reason, we always, in some way or another, think in pictures. Neither difference nor doubt nor skepticism are the starting points of thought. So I want to draw out some implications. Thinking with force encourages us to make manifest our imagistic thinking. It's not surprising that uniforms of thinking in, about, and perhaps with the forests, simulating your experiences there, for example, so overwhelmingly rely on words like tata and go that create sonic images of what they mean. Note also something about form and generality. Thanks to all the phasmids that were noticed, Sorry, thanks to all the phasmids that were not noticed, all those walking sticks that were not noticed, there's something new here. There's actually more twiggies in the world. Not only are there twigs that are twiggy, but so too are some insects. So generality is a real property of the world, one that grows in the realm of life. Life proliferates generals. Through a process of constrained confusion, Living dynamics create kinds. Think of, there's an example that people who are interested in semiotics, human animal uh, communication, and stuff like that are interested in. Uh, this is an example of a tick by Jakob von Jumskul, an early 20th century uh, animal ecologist. And he thought of a tick as sort of world poor. A tick is a kind of being that notices things but just doesn't notice that much doesn't do a lot of differentiation among the being entities of its world. So a tick, according to our school, basically will drop down on anything that has three features, warmth, hair, and the smell of butyric acid, right? So this is kind of stupid, right? But I want to show you the productive power of that kind of confusion. By not a tick, by not discriminating, discriminating between humans and deer, indiscriminately parasitizing both, confusing them, creates a kind. It's a new kind of being now, a kind of being through which Lyme disease might pass, for example. So this is, a, this is an example of this productive power of confusion. And what it means, the implications for her, anthropology and things like that, is that the world then is not just a, human, a continuum waiting to be categorized by human minds and cultures. Right? Generality is something that emerges in the world. Kinds and categories are not something that we impose on the world. Note also, and of course that's what anthropology is about, getting those cultural categories, right? But there are other forms of creating categories in the world. They're not just coming from minds, if you're like, a, you know, if you're cognitive oriented, if you're interested in neuroscience or cognition, you'd be thinking of those categories, mental categories that are sort of universally given, or you'd be thinking as a cultural anthropologist of like categories that are culturally given. But those are not the only ways of getting kinds. Kinds actually emerge through evolutionary processes, through this process of confusion. But note also something about absence, self, and future. The twiggy self, the one whose form spreads into the future, the successful walking stick, right, is the one that is not noticed. Those that are noticed, the others, those that differ, are the absent dead. And those absent dead hold open a space for the, uh, that other invisible self, the one that survived, right? 
Uh, and I'm going to come back to this. That sort of that counterintuitive thing with the ones that survive are the ones that aren't noticed. I'll come back to it when we get to more contemporary, uh, some more ethnographic examples. So the essential logic of the thinking force, the kind of logic that extends well beyond the human, also thinks its way through realms that are all too human. By which I mean the moral worlds we humans uniquely create, which permeate our lives and so deeply affect those of others. Take the following example. I was in the forest with Oswaldo. We had just tracked down the pepper he had shot, and as we caught our breath, Oswaldo began to tell me what he had done the night before. I was visiting my compadre, he said, when suddenly a menacing policeman appeared. His shirt was covered with clippings from a haircut. Frightened, Oswaldo awoke and whispered to his wife, I've dreamt badly. Fortunately, he was wrong. As the events of the day would indicate, Oswaldo had dreamt quite well. The hair on the policeman's shirt turned out to have harbored killing the peccary, whose body now lay beside us. After hauling it, because after hollow, hauling the peccary carcass, bristles will cling to a hunter's shirt, just like hair clippings. And that's Oswaldo carrying the pig that's the very day, it's the actual pig we're talking about here. Nevertheless, so either, you know, in this dream, it matters. You know, you could either be the one who's, the, 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 Dreaming of crystals on someone's shoulders could be either the fact that you're the guy doing the hunting or you're the one being hunted. He wasn't sure until he hunted this animal, right? So this interpretive confusion points to a profound ambivalence that permeates human life. Men are potent predators akin to powerful whites, such as the policemen, and yet they can also become the helpless prey of these same rapacious figures. Was the Oswaldo the policeman, or had he become prey? What happened that day in the forest didn't permanently clarify Oswaldo's ambiguous position. Who is that frightening figure that is also so familiar? How can it be so threatening and foreign also be oneself? The absential logic central to thought, life, and self reveals itself here as well. So the first part of the talk, I've given you some examples of this kind of biological logic of the thinking force. And now I'm going to show you how this actually thinks itself through much more complicated human systems that involve things like history and colonialism and stuff like that. So another example that speaks in important ways to Oswaldo's dilemma, this one comes from another hunting trip with another man. Before settling down for the night under our makeshift, makeshift thatched lean-to, Juanico admonished me to make sure I slept face up. Making my face visible, he explained, would ensure that any wandering jaguar would see me as another predator capable of looking back. If I were to sleep face down, that jaguar would treat me as, and likely turn me into an object of predation, an it. He would turn me into game, a class of prey animals that in Avila Kich was termed aicha, literally dead meat. <coughs> by sleeping face up, by contrast, I would be able to face a jaguar and respond. I did not take this picture. It's from the National Geographic. <laughs> <from the internet. laughs> I, I usually almost always say that, and I kind of say it as a joke. And I just presented this material at UCLA yesterday or two days ago, and I didn't say that. Someone thought I did. Wow, I really thought you were facing that joke. Sorry. I did not. Um, <clears throat> here is that by becoming in this fashion, facing the jaguar, looking back, by becoming a you of the jaguar's eye, an right, sort of intersubjective thing, I might continue on as a living eye. This would make me, through this intersubjective <coughs> exchange, by definition, a predatory puma, a runa puma, a rare jaguar. So how jaguars represent us, make us, and know that this is a form of representation that extends well beyond language, culture, contact, context in the human. It's not just a runa belief that this is what you should do with jaguars. This is what you have to do with jaguars. And the jaguars are, are it's the jaguars are calling the shots here, right? So the forests around Avila are peopled by jaguars, as well as all sorts of other kinds of beings. And they're also haunted, as I mentioned earlier, by the specters of so many pre-Hispanic colonial and Republican pasts. These specters would include the policemen that appeared in Oswaldo's hunting dream, as well as the dead ancestors, priests, rubber bosses, conquistadores, and pre-Hispanic chiefs, 
who also appear in dreams about the forest, and who as spirits inhabit its deepest reaches. Oswaldo's particular challenge of surviving as an eye, as it plays out in his ecology of selves, as I call it, depends on how he is hailed by these many other kinds of others. It also depends on how he responds. Is Oswaldo a helpless peckley? Is he a runa puma, a were jaguar, capable of even returning a jaguar's gaze? Or is he a white policeman who might turn on his runa neighbors with a bloodthirst that terrifies him? Actually, a few months after this dream, Oswaldo had another dream in which he's shooting a pig, and then that pig becomes a friend of his. Right? So that's always implicit in this sort of predation. Understanding Oswaldo's dilemma requires to th us to think more generally about the Luna self and to think about the self in terms of the phantom link of sensual logics it reveals. I want to give you some linguistic evidence for this in very abbreviated form. First, the Runa don't properly have an ethnonym. They don't have a name for themselves. Runa just means person. Names are reserved for others, for its. The eye is invisible, unnamed, in life, not dead meat. Second, when they do need to mark the eye point of view, they use a curious pronoun, am, which is derived from the local Spanish term for white boss, am. Am is used to mark the eye perspective of any self, human, animal, or spirit. If am, boss, lord, marks dominance in a social hierarchy, then the eye as I must be am. How could it be otherwise? Being the hunter shamans that they are, the runa are always already jaguar. If becoming prey, becoming an object, becoming, becoming literally dead meat is the main threat, and this is the terror of Oswaldo's dream that the policeman would end up carrying off his inanimate animal body, and this is also the danger of sleeping face down in the forest, the remaining predator, Puma, a living self and I, is simply what is required to survive. Puma in Avila Quichua simply means predator, the jaguar being the prototype. It too, like Ami, marks a relation of a self to the non-selves around it that living also creates. But the Puma more accurately means an I, a person, one that is not dead but indebted to all the dead that one is not. The Runa then are were jaguars, Runa Puma, and perhaps they are white jaguars, which is how in fact they appear in the ayahuasca visions of shamans living down there. Now, missionaries have long been puzzled and frustrated by the fact that the Runa quickly adopted some version of the Christian heaven, but adamantly rejected hell. Now, un and so understanding why heaven but not hell is cruci crucial to grasping some of this absential logic so central to self. Heaven, the missionaries noted, was easily understood as a place of overabundant game animals and fish, where everyone remains forever young. Hell, by contrast, is where others, especially whites and blacks, go. It's a place of punishment for others, but never for oneself. The runa have always already been runa, which for them means clothed, peaceful, salt, and Christian. They did not descend from savages. For example, myths tell how the naked savage outcasts, those are all the names that the Buddha used to name others, they're all very distinct. An outca, they call these people the savages, right? Because they have a name. That's what a, how names work in the Amazon. They're for others. Now, these people call themselves, if they were forced to call themselves, the people, like the Buddha, they call themselves the Warani, which just means the people. But now, in our normal sort of way of thinking, you would think of the runa would think of themselves the way they really were historically, like this. This looks like what you would imagine pre-Hispanic Amazonians look like. That's not how the runa see things. They don't see the Warani as primitive ancestors. They see them actually as fallen runa. These people used to be clothed in Christian, and then they became this. Nor do the Runa feel that they are on their way to becoming whites. The Runa have always already been Runa. And this feeling is always is also psychically manifest. Accounts of being killed, accounts of misfortune, being killed while fishing with dynamite, being mauled by a giant, a giant anteater, which are things that happen to people dear to me. These things never play, blame the victim. An other is always responsible. 
When the Luna die, they shed their time-worn earthen skins and go to the realm of the afterlife, deep in the forest, to become forever young. This is the realm of the masters of the animals, the lords, known as the Anu, note the term, that appear in the form of white estate owners and priests, and live in a Quito, like the capital of Ecuador, a Quito, chock full of animals and other riches deep inside the forest. This is the zone where Oswaldo becomes a policeman in order to survive. That the Runa are Anu when saying I, and that they also stand in an intimate, yet detached and sometimes subservient relationship to those Anu, who inhabit an always already realm, distributes itself and marks the pain of those disjunctures that separate its excessive instantiations. So I want to explore here the necessary and painful ways in which part of the Swaldo is in this other Anu spirit. So understanding this requires understanding how the spirit realm of the afterlife captures the detritus of history in a future, and how it does so in a very special way by virtue of the fact that it's located deep within a living forest. That is, my claim is that this virtual spiritual realm is what it is thanks to the special way that it's located in a thinking forest that amplifies life's essential logics. So I want to go back and think about Oswaldo's dilemma. Is he a pig or is he the hunter? In terms of those twiggy phantom-like animals, the phasmids, the walking sticks, what such a living organism and lineage, these walking sticks, what it is, what such a living organism and lineage, an incontinuity of eyes, is, is the product of what it's not. Such an organism is intimately related to the many absent lineages that did not survive. It is because of these deaths that living organism, organisms fit with or conform to or represent the world around them. In a sense, the living, like the phasmid we mistake for a twig, are the ones that were not noticed. They are the ones that continue to potentially persist in form and out of time. And yet this not noticing, this persistence is this persistence, sorry, this persistence is dependent on all the other lineages of proto-walking sticks that were noticed and are therefore no longer around. It's the absent dead that make the living phasmids who they are as the ones who survive. Note the logical shift here. The focus is on what is not present. But this absence gives rise to a sort of presence that is invisible. The walking sticks that are increasingly confused with twigs, and there's more of them. What these surviving insects are is the product of all the things that happened to others. Nothing happened to the surviving ones, and they didn't do anything. You could say that we, living beings like the walking sticks, owe our lives to the absent dead. But you could also say that the dead were the presences that make our lives as enduring absences possible. It's this weird, counterintuitive, absential logic that reveals itself in the ways in which Oswaldo, as a predatory Bruna Puma, as a were jaguar, shape shape-shifting jaguar, is alive in reciprocal intersubjectivity, as opposed to dead as object of predation, a thing. He is a puma, and a puma is just simply a way of saying I, or a not, an OT, an absence but one that is haunted and held by all the dead. This logic also reveals itself in the ways in which the, in, in the always already runa as opposed to the fallen alkas. Something happened to the alkas, nothing happened to the runa, right? As well as in the self that can never harm herself, right? When you get in this logic, you can never do anything to yourself. Others can do things to you, but you are just in some ways an absence, right? And it informs the ways in which the runa can continue unchanging in heaven and reserve the punishment of hell to others. Bad things happen to them. I continue, as I always have been in heaven. All these partake in this absential logic that they share with the twiggy phasmid, because they all are about the relationship of right to death in the ways that become particularly salient, because they unfold in a thinking force. So life uniquely involves the ways in which the future comes to affect the present. In order for a jaguar to successfully pounce on a peccary walking through the forest, she must be able to represent where that peccary will be. This amounts to an importation of the future, the peccary's future position into the present via the mediation of science. 
right? So there's this weird thing in which being a semiotic being, you're always <coughs> having to bring the future into the present. To be alive today is to exist in some ways in the future. It is to have a being in futuro, as Peirce calls it. <clears throat> the tropical forest with so many kinds of life amps up this future producing quality of life. <clears throat> the afterlife, that Quito deep in the forest, is an emergent outcome of this greater than human semiotic web and its future producing potential. <clears throat> it captures and amplifies something of how life creates future in ways that house the absences of the past. The forest, in fact, is haunted by the past. For example, and there's many like this. Forest demons wearing where forest demons that walk the forest today, people talk about this, experience it. This is a representation of the center of forest demons, right? <clears throat> they wear, <clears throat> sorry, I'm just have a horse. They wear the habits of priests. <clears throat> but priests stopped wearing those habits many generations ago in this part of the world. These habits are frozen in time. They're held by and persist in a sort of timeless passion in a thinking forest. So when hunters dream, they come to see things in the forest from the point of view of the masters. This is a sort of virtual but real realm, a vantage from which what goes on in the forest becomes interpretable. Sleeping, stepping into the realm of the masters, as hunters do in their dreams, is then a way of stepping into the future to affect the present. You dream in order to be able to hunt, right? Oswaldo killed the pig because it was he, Oswaldo, who became the predatory, the predatory policeman in his dream. That Oswaldo was the policeman with clippings on his shoulders and not the pig saddled across the policeman's back means that part of him, part of Oswaldo, lives in that spirit realm of the afterlife. What is more, his life, his being, depends on this fact. In other words, for Oswaldo to remain an eye, a living sign, he must be able to be interpretable by this virtual, yet real, realm of the masters, a realm where he can be hailed as a you and not treated as an it. And this will only be possible when he too actually becomes an I, an Anu, a master in Futuro. And yet that future also houses all of the absences, all of the dead, that make the continuing present Oswaldo's endurance as a specific kind of I possible. In a sense, he is like a phasm that owes his survival to all the absent ancestors that were less twiggy. Oswaldo's life, in some ways, is predicated upon the deaths of others. He, like all of us, is indebted to the many dead that make us. So let me now come back to where I began. Why should we think with forests? Being human, being a symbolic species, a kind of being whose life is what it is thanks to the ways we are held by our language-like kinds of thinking, with its abstractions, negations, and meta levels, we already have a tendency to separate culture from nature. Being humanists, focusing on the singular capacity that makes humans so distinctive, focusing, that is, on meaning systems, social construction, discursive regimes, makes things worse. The divide we live between culture and nature is crazy making. It produces a literal kind of societal schizophrenia, a split mind. And it's a collective madness that is spreading quickly. In this Anthropocene, this disturbing time of ours in which our distinctively human mode of construction is threatening to destruct the planet, this madness has reached cosmic proportions. And in the face of this madness, what should we do? Donna Haraway has suggested that this, in this indeterminate epoch of ours, marked by the threat of extinction and extermination, marked, you might say, by the specter of the disappearance of kinds, of an altogether different kind, our obligation is to hold open spaces for other kinds of beings. And this is what I want to think to, I'm just closing up here, I have a couple more pages to read, but I, this is what I want to think with at the end of this talk. And it's, it's really asking, why think with porous? I'm getting at the stakes of this. What is it, and I want to do this by thinking about 
why she formulates this ethical imperative in our times in the way she did. And I think that thinking with thinking for us can help us here. So let me unpack this. We humans have become central actors in affecting global climatic systems with important implications for life on Earth. Everybody now recognizes that nature and culture, the non-human and the human, must be thought together. Culture, in Bruno Latour's terms, has become a force of nature. But I worry that this realization gives license to a certain analytic of mixture, which I don't think is helpful or true to the world, an analytic that creates little homunculi at all levels. The hyphen in nature's cultures, or material semiotics, is the new pineal gland in the little Cartesian heads that this analytic unwittingly engenders at all scales, even when those mind-body parts do not perceive their relating. I think that being true to the world means being ontologically precise about how we conceptualize the ways in which the human relates to that which lies beyond it. To put it baldly, I see myself forced into an ontological discussion because at a minimum, I have to say something about what human language is in order to capacitate other kinds of worlds included by this reality. Ontology is a funny and trendy and granted problematic word in anthropology. I don't know where this is a, this is a very big debate in cultural anthropology. I don't know whether it's hit the archaeological world or other places, but this whole thing about ontology is important here um, in our field. If when, but when we say their ontology, it's just the same culture. That's what we're talking about. But when, when we say just ontology, we don't say their ontology, we slip into a kind of universalism. So let me be clear by what I mean by ontology and why it's so important in my work. It's basically because I, I need to find a way to talk outside of, some, of cultural construction, social construction. So for me, an ontological ontology is one that is open to exploring realities, whatever those may be, that stand beyond us, beyond human social construction, which of course creates its own realities. And what are the stakes here? Doing anthropology ontologically addresses this political question by reconfiguring both what the ends of such a practice might be, as well as the means by which we could achieve them. So this is, so to be provocative, in these kinds of ontological explanations that I'm interested in, I actually find more resonance with Emil Durkheim, which is something, somebody that a lot of social anthropologists think, oh, he's just so boring and essay. And I find more relevance with him, relevance with him than I do with his rival, Gabriel Tarr, which is one of the current muses for this kind of way of thinking with other kinds of beings and materials and stuff like that. Let me explain. The Tardian ontology, the way of thinking about the world, is a flat one. Everything, you can relate anything to anything else. For Tard, you can relate technology to society, to individuals, it's all the same thing. Durkheim had an idea of emergence. The social society is an emergent reality which cannot be explained by the individual, just as the biological could not be explained by the chemical. Emergent also means hierarchical, nested, or unidirectional. There are things in the world that are related in a hierarchical fashion. You can have life without self-organization. Self-organization is the kind of spontaneous generation of form we see in crystals, for example. But you, but, but you can have self-organization without life, right? And you can have symbolic reference. You can't have symbolic reference without indices. Symbols, the kinds of things we use in the language, emerge from relations among indices. But you can have indices without symbols. The semiosis of life is a case in point. Now, we tend to see hierarchy as bad, a biology that focuses on, that focuses on arborescent descent or affiliation is bad. But one that focuses on, say, rhizomatic lateral gene transfer is good. But this just conflates logical and ontological hierarchies with moral ones. And this confusion is an effect of the way language infects our thinking. The moral is, is something all too human, but hierarchy isn't. Now, I want to be clear, though, that although I'm sort of celebrating Durkheim because of this emergent idea of emergence, he was wrong on one crucial point, and the point that has gotten us in trouble. His mistake was to treat emergent phenomena as separate or radically cut off from that from which they emerged, right? So for Durkheim, there's no reason to study biology if you study society. There's no reason to study psychology if you study society. Society can only be 
understood in terms of society. That's why you get the kind of separations of fields that, of course, we all know, you all know from your from the departments in the, in the here at Santa Barbara, right? And this was his price for purifying the social. And this is what has gotten social science into so much trouble. We just don't know how to think beyond social constructions. But the antidote is not to deny hierarchy. A lot of my work has involved exploring how novel emergent phenomena are continuous with that from which they stem, and how these continuities create aperture. I want to emphasize, emphasize that although there is continuity, the world is not a mere continuum. Emergence is real. There are breaks in the fabric of the world through which novel causal dynamics erupt. Life is one, right? Life emerged from a world that didn't have life. It's a new kind of thing in the world. The human is another. This point bears on the Anthropocene question. There's something unique about life as opposed to non-life. Living beings think. This is related to something else. Value is uniquely intrinsic to life. What our obligations to living beings might be, as I'll make clear, rests on this. There are things that are good or bad for a living being and its potential for growth, its potential to learn by experience, to think. This is intrinsic to its being. And we humans might feel obligations towards these other kinds of living beings, for which there is a good and a bad, because we humans are uniquely moral beings. So if value emerges with life, the moral possibility to reflect on and act on one value, to think at a meta level about the potential good of another and to conduct oneself accordingly, emerges with symbolic thought, with language, you might say. <coughs> but it stands, the sort of human thing, stands in a relation of emergent continuity to the value intrinsic to, to the life from which it stems. So our moral worlds <coughs> can intersect with the lives of non humans beings precisely because there are things that are good or bad for them. So if ethics involves reflexive attention to another that is rather than other, one that is not one, including the one that we might become, then multi-species ethnography, the kind of stuff I've been talking about, in these times might be a privileged site for an ethical practice, because these are really radical others we're trying to think with. So what kind of practice would this be? And here I want to unpack Donna Haraway's call to hold open spaces for other kinds of beings. I want to do so by coming back to life's absential logics, as they're amplified by thinking forest. So to my mind, central to holding open is a notion of play. I want to talk briefly about play before ending this talk and opening this up to a much more informal conversation. Um, and by play, I mean the following. I mean a space in which previously coupled means and relations are loosened, such that something new can emerge. Play is ubiquitous in the living world, because this is because means ends, relations are intrinsic to the living world, and not just something we humans impose on it. So in this technical Weberian sense, the world is enchanted. By saying that life is semiotic, that forests think, I'm also saying that function, representation, purpose, and telos, in short, ends, are part and parcel of the living world. But if we think of means and ends as tightly coupled, transitive and deductive, there's no room for something new, for growth, for flourishing, which of course is also central to life. And this is where play comes in. Think of the biological production of variation. This is a form of play, right? You've got many more kinds of variants. Some of them are not useful, we don't know. But that's, that's a form of play that's required in, a, in, a, in an evolutionary dynamic, right? Or think of Gregory Bateson, when he talked about animal play. A nip for a nip that, did, that, that when an animal plays, like a dog, they'll nip. What's a nip? It's a kind of a bite that denotes the bite, a real bite, but not that which the bite denotes, right? A nip is is referring to, to aggressive biting, but it's not. It's a form, and by, by, by cutting that off, by nipping instead of biting, or by saying, I'm going to do this thing that seems aggressive, but I'm not going to do all the things that would be entailed by that chain of, that transitive chain of other things that would lead to the aggression, you're suspending the, that mean end relation and getting play. That's how dogs play. They nip. And 
We should remember that Levi-Strauss's Pensée Sauvage is also a form of play, and that it's a kind of thought that asks for no return. And in times of crisis, this is exactly what we forget about. We forget about play. And this is as evident in radical politics as it is in the neoliberalization of North American universities, in which accountability and benefit to society calculations are closing, the, closing down the space for play in ways that feel thought. I mean, if you're me asked to produce something as a professor, you can't play, right? Playing is central to being creative as a professor, right? But following this logic of play, the Anthropocene requires more than a response. For the challenge is to hold open a space for play. A space for the column response no longer needs to be the operative dynamic. There's an absential logic at the heart of this. What does it mean to hold open, to make room for it? How is it that a lap for Kasia Silverman, as she was inspired by Leonardo da Vinci, or a carrier bag, as opposed to a club or a spear, as most of the wind tells us, holds open, and by doing so does something? And what kind of a doing is this? What does a bag do? It holds open a space, delimited, constrained, defined not, not by what is there, <clears throat> we don't know what will end up in that container, but by what is not, by what is excluded, by what doesn't come in. And the idea is that we should be like these kinds of bags. We should learn to be vessels that hold open a space to which the forests, elusive thoughts can continue to think their wild ways. <coughs> But again, why? Let me come back to the states of this project. It ends in terms of this ethnographically informed ontological exploration, one that reveals, amplifies, and perhaps might even actualize a certain absential logic already present among us, a logic in which means and ends are suspended. Thinking with force leads me to appreciate how ends are intrinsic to the non-human living world. That is, value is intrinsic to living dynamics. And this kind of value exists in a relation of emergent continuity to a human kind of value. We humans can take a stand, whatever that stand may be, on what might be good or bad. And of course, just what might be good or bad is complicated. But novel means and ends emerge in, the, in this telic, living world thanks to the, product, to the productive suspension of means and ends. Right? This is the essential space, space of play. This is how you get new things in the, in the biological world, speciation, things like that, right? So the stakes, the value, the ends of this way of thinking with forests stems from the recognition of how ends are intrinsic to such thinking forests. Now, this is, of course, an admittedly ontological endeavor in a traditional sense. It's a focus on what is. I'm telling you how forests think. But the means by which forests think, how they go about thinking, reconfigures this ontological endeavor because the play that is central to it productively suspends means and ends. So if we are to do something in these times when our collective end seems so uncertain, that doing would involve finding ways to sustain the possibility of doing nothing. It would involve finding ways to hold open spaces for sylvan thinking. So if the ontology is important here, it's not just to say how things are, but to create an opening for a more general kind of us, one not just limited to us humans. It would be an ontology not just concerned with delimiting what is, but dedicated to the real capacitation of the not which is among us. And that's what I'm after. And hopefully we can try to unpack some of that. Um, some of that is probably a little bit more dense than what we eat on a Friday afternoon uh, to an audience that is coming from many different kinds of places. Um, so 